So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, this is what we call contributed chap uh, session. That means uh, you know all of us are part of this together. So it's not organized session, but because you have contributed um, a paper, uh, each of you individually, and they fit really nicely about food in small scale fisheries. Now, if you had attended some of the talks this morning, there has already been some discussion about the importance of looking at small scale fisheries as part of food. And, and this is why we think this session is gonna be really, really important. So um, the, um, our chair of the session is actually not able to participate but um, I'm going I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be more people, I mean, the alternative host who is now here, I'm going to make her a panelist, right, first, and then she would then be the host of the session uh, for you. Just a second here. Okay, the, the, the order of the presentation would be as follow. This would be um, um, Raymond would go first, and then Annie, and then Winter, Wind, Winter, and then Erie. So there's only four present. Is that right? Is everybody? Annie? No, sorry. Raymond, Annie, Winter, and Erie. Great. So only four presentation, and your chair is here. That's Dr. Supakan, and she will be able to uh, you know, moderate the session and keep time and do Q&A for you. So we need to stop exactly at, um, at um, well, it's um, what, 7.15 local time, but there's only four sessions of paper, sorry. So you would be able to do okay. And do join us later at the Girls Who Fish session, which would be another website, another event link and uh, enjoy that. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. i talk to you later, bye-bye. Hi, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think uh, maybe for the, the time of uh, presentation, maybe average about 15 to 20 minutes. And we will uh, give last 10 minutes for Q&A or if, uh, some people have a question, okay. So let's start, please introduce yourself and uh, continue your presentation. Yes, so I'm the first presenter, I guess. <laughs> My name is Raymond. I am a PhD student at the University of Technology, Sydney. And I'm presenting my paper uh, on behalf of my two co-authors, who happens to be my supervisors as well, uh, who are also participating in this uh, conference. Uh, Kate, you might know, is one of the presenters in the earlier session. And then Mike uh, Febeni will also be presenting later on, I think tomorrow. So I will share my presentation now. Uh, Uh, let me know if um, my presentation is shown now. Yes. 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 So basically, I am presenting on a paper that we um, published um, recently, which is on small scale fisheries in the blue economy, a review of scholarly papers and multilateral documents. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Raymond. And I'm presenting this on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Michael Febeni and Kate Barkley. So we are based at the University of Technology, Sydney, and at the Center for Climate, Society, and Environmental Research. So in this presentation, I will introduce to you the concept of blue economy, and then I will show you the procedure we use to review the literature. Um, and then preliminary findings that we have and conclude with the way forward. So as you may already know, since the 2012 um, Rio conference, 
the concept of ocean governance has been characterized by blue economy. And there are three main key objectives of this blue economy concept, even though it's clear demarcations is not uh, really known as people keep increasing and adding their own understanding of the concept. And in some other areas, it, it, it is a policy discourse for them. And in other um, concepts, people use it as a governance framework. And so in this particular presentation, I'm not really focusing much on that, but I intend to introduce you to some of those things and then zoom straight to what we have seen per our, our literature review. Now, the key concepts or objectives of the blue economy is one to harness the economic value of the ocean and marine resources, and then two, to ensure um, environmental sustainability. In this case, looking at conservation of these resources for generations. The other thing that has cut a cause within the literature is the issue of social equity and inclusiveness. And this is not really reflected in, in, in across board as other people exclude social equity and inclusion, whilst others strongly advocate for social equity and inclusion. And the blue economic sectors really cut across all the sectors you can think of related to the ocean. And there are emerging sectors that have been uh, propagated, including marine aquaculture, also energy um, sources, as well as seabed mining, safety and surveillance, marine biotechnology. You can mention them as these are forms of new and emerging sectors of the ocean and coastal economy that uh, has potential for economic growth and, and, and they can be harnessed for economic value. So what we did was to actually understand how the concept of the blue economy is actually being discussed within the policy arena, as well as within the academic context. This uh, was important because um, policy is actually focused on practice was academia most of times provide the policy with advice and knowledge based on research. And so the two are complementary. Uh, and, and sometimes they can be, um, they can disagree as well in terms of their views on, on concepts. And so it was important for us to look at how these two stakeholders view the blue economy in terms of how it is being turned out as a policy or uh, narrative. So in all we had, we did a Scopus search and we had 83 academic articles and these were pruned down based on the um, search criteria to about 40 of them, which were eligible for uh, inclusion in our research. And then we further did content analysis and this was reduced down to 31. This was supplemented by the policy documents that we took from multilateral organizations, which were more uh, interested in the concept of blue economy and had written concept papers or involved themselves in one or two other blue economy activities or propagated blue economy. And so in all, we had 30 um, um, uh, papers plus nine policy documents that we reviewed. And this was basically done by in-depth web ritual of, of, of the policy documents from their websites. And, and, and the academic literature search was basically through the Scopus uh, search engine. But to boost our discussions, we um, also use other relevant sources, um, such as media reports and other um, articles, which were not part of our search uh, results. So I am going to present you the outcome of the, the review in three parts. One is to look at the regional bodies and how they have conceived and discussed the concept of the blue economy. And then I'm going to talk to you about how um, multilateral organizations have conceived the concept of the blue economy and how they are propagating it. And then thirdly, I'll tell you how academia has also observed based on research how the concept of the blue economy is being turned out. So to deal with the regional blocks, and, and in this case, if you, we're looking at Asia, we're looking at Pacific Islands, and we are looking at Africa. These are the three continents that 
the harnessing of ocean and coastal resources are lacking and are perceived to be the frontier that these ocean and, and coastal uh, ecosystems can fully be harnessed since they are lacking in terms of the development of their economies. And in terms of the Pacific, the blue economy actually um, propagate the harmonization of development approaches and agendas. Um, and in the Pacific Ocean is always associated with the, their history, their culture and their economy. And for that reason, if you look at the discourse of the blue economy within the Pacific, culture, economy and history has stopped in terms of what the concept of blue economy means. To them, the ocean is a source of livelihood in terms of building their economy, but again, it is also part of their culture and their history since the two cannot be decoupled. In, in Asia, we find different meaning of the blue economy based on the review. And in Asia, it is basically looking at conservation and sustainable development. And in this, it includes infrastructure and technology, um, innovative financing mechanisms, as well as proactive institutional setups. So they are looking at how the blue economy can propagate infrastructure for development as well as technology, and then innovation in terms of using the ocean to secure more funding to, to propagate their development, as well as pro proposing institutional setups that can help manage the ocean and coastal systems. In Africa, on the other hand, the, the blue economy is actually a, a new concept that means uh, 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 that, that gives Africa the chance to propagate its economic growth, its economic transformation, as well as development. And so if you look at the AU documentation, the blue economy has been termed as the new frontier for economic transformation, growth, and development in the African continent. So these are three different continents, but the, the, their view of the blue economy is actually different in terms of how they conceive and perceive uh, how they want to harness their ocean and coastal resources. Now, discussing the different multilateral organization, we look at the EU, we look at the World Bank, the OED, and the FAO. And these are the emerging trends. Growth and emerging sectors are topping, and small-scale fisheries has been downplayed. In here, you realize that aquaculture and mariculture are more associated with the blue economy regarding its future rather than small scale fisheries, as well as market based financing mechanisms being emphasized as a source of economic value. Uh, and, and this puts small scale fisheries under threat when you're looking at um, market based funds being the source of financing the, uh, the, the development of the blue economy. Moreover, you also find out that. Economic activities are prioritized over social and cultural values. For multilateral organizations, most of them are focused on economic activities of the ocean and coastal environment. But the, the issues of the social and cultural values of coastal communities and people are really um, and really being emphasized in terms of how multilateral organizations involved in the blue economic and socialization really tend to implement the concept of blue economy. And in, 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 in the other hand, you find out that pro poor initiatives um, um, really in developing countries are the only source of um, a hope for small scale fisheries. And in this case, it is mostly the FAO, which is really interested in small scale fisheries. And, and therefore, they promote the concepts of pro poor initiatives to support small scale fisheries in developing countries. And in, among all the, the, the multilateral organizations that we, we reviewed, the, the FAO was the leading organization in terms of protecting and supporting the livelihoods of small scale fisheries within the blue economy. The rest really focus on other areas which tend to downplay the importance and the essence uh, of, of small scale fisheries. But we all know that small scale fisheries really plays a huge role in terms of um, livelihoods, culture, even social networks and many other uh, 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 coastal behavior and, and organizations. Now, in terms of the academic hegemony of the blue economy, key things have really turned out 
um, based on the academic view of the concept of the blue economy. One is the concern for equity and social justice, sustainability across jurisdictions, as well as uh, in different ocean uses. So academia has raised concerns regarding equity and social justice in the implementation of the blue economy, as well as sustainability for different ocean uses. And in this case, small scale fisheries, as well as small coastal um, uh, communities have always been highlighted as a vulnerable group in the implementation of the blue economy. And also um, the blue economy strategy is based on the academia um, uh, research has revealed that it pays less attention to social and economic livelihood dimensions. Different dimensions of the blue economy have been proposed and highlighted, emphasized, but the issue of social and economic livelihood dimensions are less um, affected in, in how generally the blue economy is being uh, put forth. And this is a major concern for small scale fisheries uh, in terms of their livelihood sustainability as well as viability. And in particular, marine fisheries um, is often frame in policy and, and, and in, in the multilateral organizations to suit more of industrial and large scale fisheries and aquaculture than small scale fisheries. And this has really consistently appeared in our review that marine fisheries in terms of how these multilateral organizations and, um, and policymakers view the blue economy is synonymous to that of industrial and aquaculture. Small scale fisheries are often not linked with how the blue economy is being viewed. And this is a major concern if we, we are going forward with the blue economy in terms of how it is, it is going to be implemented and in terms of how countries and multilateral organizations actually wants to go ahead with it, it financing. You can't de decouple these two and, and, and pay less attention to small scale fisheries. And most importantly, uh, um, small scale fisheries diversity, their uniqueness to achieving the blue economy is not emphasized. It is not entirely true that based on the nature of small scale fisheries, they cannot play a role in, term, in terms of how um, we achieve blue economy. It is indeed true that the uniqueness of small scale fisheries, their diversity, and some specific characteristics and features of them will actually help in achieving the blue economy than other large scale fisheries and, and, and aquaculture. And it's important that we, we pay much attention to that. And these are some of the concerns raised within the academia and within the scholarly uh, uh, context. Now to conclude, generally what the study emphasizes, oh, sorry, is that small scale fishery social aspects are actually important in achieving some of the stated goals of the blue economy. If you look at conservation, small scale fisheries are better in place to help conserve our ocean and coastal resources than large scale fisheries. Looking at the quantity and the technology advancement involved in large scale fishing and the destruction it causes to marine ecosystem, small scale fisheries are better suited to help achieve conservation and sustainability than other marine sectors. Moreover, we also concluded that blue economy should be guided by goals that support small scale fishery governance. Throughout the review, we realized that policies, governance, and legislations that are being put forward really do not support small scale fisheries. So, in this vein, we recommend that small scale fisheries need to really be decoupled from other uh, blue economy sectors and be supported by governance initiatives and governance structures to keep and support them for their growth. And so this paper has been published in the Ocean and Coastal Journal, and you can have a read of it for more information and to understand clearly some of the arguments as I could not do this uh, because of time in this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raymond. And, uh, I would like to go to the next. Any 
Yang Song? Yes. Hi. Yes. Could, Hello. Okay. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi, my name is Annie Yong Song at the Youth Yes, and I'll be sharing the screen. And I did it wasn't um I was not able to share the screen earlier, so let me just try um this time and see how it goes. <laughs> okay, sorry, share and uh, can you see the screen without the notes or with the notes? Uh, yes, I, I, can, I can see see the screen. Okay, so without the notes, right? Yes. Okay, cool. All right, um, I figured it out. Okay, so hello, um, everyone. So today's presentation is about our paper titled Shaping Priorities in Conservation political economy of protecting marine species. And this paper is co-authored with uh, Jessica Vandenberg and Kirsten Maroon Andrews. So we have four sections for today's presentation, introduction, literature review and framework, and case study and conclusions. So introduction. So there has been a big push for marine conservation. The Glasgow Climate Pact at the COP26 in 2021 includes ocean-based action as a pillar of global approach. And also there is a call to preserve 30% of global oceans by 2030. And against this background, our study highlights um, what's on the agenda related to the oceans and what species conservation is being prioritized. So species prioritization is a bit biased socially and scientifically. There are greater intrinsic value for Western society and spatial and taxonomic biases in natural history. And this leads to further environmental problems and social injustice in local communities. So we ask why and how does species prioritization occur in conservation? And we used ethnographic accounts and discursive analysis. And there are three case studies at local, national, and international scales. Um, and the local studies is about coral reef and national case is about pair of fish in Dominican Republic and international scales is about the sea cucumbers in CITES. So existing studies find that science practice gap is a central problem in addressing environmental challenges. And it also points out that the, um, there are political and economic biases in conservation politics. And our study actually goes beyond this findings or arguments. Um, and we propose that political economies play a critical role in driving species-focused conservation policies. So conservation policies are often based on taxonomic bias, which is driven by scientific information and popular culture perception. And this bias to conservation politics generates social impacts on marine uh, conservation and lack of understanding of social dynamics. And this is driven by a disconnect between the actual and assumed sociocultural landscape of host communities. And this leads to ecological and social failures and also dispossession and displacement of local communities. We argue that conservation agendas are shaped by institutions and their values that design, execute, and fund conservation programs. And this argument actually resonates with the Holmes 2010, stating that conservation policy results not from popular movements on the ground, but from well-connected elites, including public, nonprofit, and private actors. So moving on to the three case studies now. So the first case study looks at the local case on coral reef species in Indonesia. Specifically, we looked at corporate social responsibility initiative. It illustrates how external values and preferences of uh, private institutions supporting conservation programs affect outcomes. In this case, overshadowing local needs and values. The coral restoration um, is opposed as a dual conservation and development initiative under a win-win logic and 
while present, well, presenting um, corporate interest in social development and environmental um, conservation as a synergetic in practice. And, but um, the corporate-led conservation actually produces diverse and far-reaching network, but there is a limited food security value on coral coral reef species to the target community. In this sense, there is an issue of a represent, representation of roles and responsibility of industry and local fishers in the CSR campaign. For instance, industry has more power over conservation narrative and framing who is to blame. Um, the second study is about the pair of fish in the Dominican Republic. Um, there is a legal ban on pair of fish, um, which was assigned into law in Dominican Republic on June 19, 20, um, 1917. Pair of fish is actually a fish for cheapest um, category. And so there is a no, actually, um, there was a little attention to pair of fish. Um, and since because they are primarily consumed by local fishing communities and sometimes by Dominicans traveling back to their family homes in coastal areas. And uh, but 20, um, 2018 social media campaign was launched to appeal to um, seasonal beach goers by arguing that if they included fish, a uh, pair of fish in their consumption choice, they, they would be no, uh, they would have no beaches left to visit anymore. So during the, um, during the week of Easter 2018, um, the beach, actually the beaches of Dominican Republic um, had a little, little, um, campaign board for to stop the consumption of a pair of fish. And so the these pair of fish were um, called as a laborers of sand factories of nation providing a crucial natural infrastructure of tourism economy. So while fishers stopped catching pair of fish for a while, and actually they did respect for the ban, but it did not last long pair of fit because pair of fish were essential income sources to small scale fishers. In their interpretation, the ban on pair of fish was entangled within broader politics meant to eradicate dive fishers from coast um, and sea environment. So replacing fishers with the tourist. So the third study is about sea cucumbers in CITES. Um, trade in sea cucumbers involves um, Hong Kong and China as exporters and range of developing countries um, as exporters. Sorry, I said Hong Kong and China as importers and developing countries as exporter and uh, traders. And there are huge issues uh, regarding overharvesting, overexploitation, and illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, and illegal trade on sea cucumbers. So, to eradicate or to mitigate this issue, in 20, uh, 2002, US proposed to list the sea cucumbers in CITES as endangered species. And in 2019, CITES um, members adopted the proposed the list uh, to list the three species of sea cucumbers. Numbers. However, there's also um, socioeconomic implications for those who rely on um, for rely on sea cucumbers for their livelihoods. So, in order to address this issue, there are several efforts in FAO and CITES. For instance, FAO had workshops on the sea cucumber management, and there is a still ongoing working group on CITES and livelihoods. However, the issue still remains because the values and interests of decision making institutions still take on more significance in marine conservation policies compared to those small scale fishers and traders using sea cucumbers. So now moving on to our conclusion. So this is actually the summary of our study. So we had the three different scales, local, national, and international. And we pointed out, if you look at the fourth role, um, labeled as a political economy motivation, we explained that the first study, coral reef eco, um, ecosystem in Indonesia was driven by 
restored, uh, rest, restoring, restoring coral reef species and trying to contribute to, to local food security and CSR sustainable goals. And Parafish is this um, is a similar case. It's actually uh, protecting domestic tourism sector, and sea cucumbers case is about preserving endangered species of sea cucumbers while incorporating local needs. But as you can um, see, there are impacts on local livelihoods. Um, all of these three cases are involving local uh, fishers and users, which are not really incorporating their needs to their policies. So we see that there's are two implications for this study. So local engagement is critical for balancing um, the local livelihoods and sustainable use of na uh, nature, but also for conserving vulnerable species. And our finding can provide insights into the ways of promoting equity in conservation, including how policy decisions are made. So that's the end of the um, presentation for me. So thank you for listening. Yeah, I think I don't know, but we have missed our host. <laughs> maybe because I'm looking like the list right now, the panelists. So maybe not, I don't know if it was the, I think the turn for wind, I, I believe. So maybe we can just go, go on because maybe she had some problem or something like that. Yes. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna continue. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so like uh this is uh this is uh, my name is Wente. I'm from uh Gaffer Modoma project. So I'm currently working in the Gaffer Modoma of uh Myanmar. Uh, so this is uh, my presentation to share on behalf of uh, the dedicated team of the GAFA Motoma project, uh, which is implementing the EAFM or ecosystem approach to fishery management in the area. So uh, it's going to be like my presentation going to be a little bit different from the previous two because it is not the research uh, project or sharing our success and achievements on how we did great, but it is about uh, an experiential sharing of how we are like in the process of navigating and uh, to melt and how to evolve through uh, changes in implementing conservation activities in the Gaffer Motomar uh, for the well being of small scale fishers in the area. So, uh, we hope this experience uh, will uh, support in filling the gaps of uh, global landscapes for fishery management and changing or, you know, like uh, politically unstable nations uh, like uh, what happening in Sanyama. Uh, so I would like to introduce about like the, the area itself. Uh, so this is the Gulf of Um So it is one of the most dynamic estuaries uh, because of uh, the flow and sedimentation of four major uh, rivers that attributed to, uh, to the region. And also like uh, due to that is created extensive uh, mat flats and it, they are regarded, it is regarded to be the high, uh, like the biggest in the South Asia as well. Uh, so as it is show, show here, so like the finest shape uh, area of this uh, perennial uh, turbidity is about uh, 45,000 kilometers square and yet it swells a very dynamic social and ecological systems uh, which are closely interact and dependent on each other. Uh, so for GOMP, uh, so the GOM or GAFA Modoma, it's include coastal wetlands and in that wetlands, uh, whereas its habitats are very important uh, for marine and aquatic species, <clears throat> especially the uh, the show, the, especially uh, like the the shorebirds. So due to its uh, protective um, ecosystem, so the the GOMB hosts about uh, 150,000 one, 150, wintering birds annually, and it supports uh, foods and habitats for commercially important fishery species as well as other species of conservation uh, concerns, uh, such as uh, like one of the flex species, uh, flagship species would be spawn based sandpiper, which is uh, critically endangered. Uh, globally, and also there are some sort of uh, others uh, like charismatic species such as uh, Eowody dolphins and other two species of uh, porpoise and dolphins are existing in here. So in addition to its rich biodiversity, uh, <clears throat> Uh, it is also, uh, the, the area also directly supports uh, foods, livelihoods for more than 60,000 people who are residing along uh, 68 uh, coastal villages of the coast. However, it is uh, important to uh, consider that about half of these population are landless and most of them are overly dependent on the ecosystem services of the uh, GOM. So when we are 
flesh uh, when we get through uh, the livelihoods of the coastal immune uh, communities. So, like the major are, are like the fish, the capture fisheries, agriculture, livestock, and the and, and the surface uh, uh, wage labor. Uh, but uh, the capture fishery is kind of uh, an important source for income for people involved throughout the market chains. And in the western back of the Gulf, so like they are more dependent on uh, coastal fisheries, while uh, the, the eastern back is uh, more on the uh, freshwater fishery. Uh, and also like uh, and also like due to these extensive ma uh, man uh, mudflats, so the crab harvesting is a valuable source of income for small scale fishers, including women and landless households. And also like uh, it is really important that like the the indigenous aquatic culture is very um, kind of uh, rooted here for at least uh, forty years, and it is widely uh, practiced uh, in some of the areas of the Gulf as well. <clears throat> Uh, so due to this uh, significant importance, so it was uh, recognized as uh, full Ramsar sites of Myanmar in 2017 and into 2020, it was extended uh, uh, to over like uh, 100,000 hectares of this of its areas. So however, of uh, this importance, so there are also like states a lot of uh, threats uh, that is a kind of impact sitting on the whole social and ecological uh, it, components of the system. So there are uh, some kind of uh, illegal fishing happenings and also like that the fishings are not uh, regulated. And also there are uh, habitat degradation due to uh, mining of sands and mining of gold in the upstreams of the rivers. And also like there are uh, significant impacts on the threatened species such as bat huntings and uh, bycatch of uh, bycatch of marine mammals in small scale uh, fishing, as well as uh, due to uh, the, the due to like it was the coastal areas so with the climate change is not uh, is not inevitable, as well as due to these actions, so they are decreased uh, fish catch as well as the raw agriculture yields uh, in the region as well. So these all created uh, limited livelihood options for the communities, as well as the other challenging issue is about the erosions of the, um, the, the area due to the nature of the, uh, due to the dynamic nature of the coast. So in addition, like there are also like uh, the challenges in order to uh, tackle these uh, threats uh, that uh, so it is very huge area right so that's why it is a very difficult to uh it's, it's very difficult in considering conservation actions to tackle these uh threats or these challenges and also there are uh, due to like the situation of the country so there are lacks of uh, coordination amongst uh, sectors and governors as well as there are also lacks of uh, interest or lacks of awareness by the community as well as other stakeholders uh, the limitation in infrastructures and market to assess also uh, limit uh, the, the further development of the economic uh, valuable uh, ecosystem services of the Gulf of Mogama. So however, we still have opportunities uh, due to like, the commitment from the state and regional government uh, at the time, uh, but it's kind of faded away after uh, what happens. Uh, uh, and also like there are also uh, very strong engagement of the stakeholders, especially the communities, as well as uh, the universities and other private sectors as well. And also due to uh, it was uh, designated as Ramsar site, it also can get like the attention from the people as well. And we do, uh, and also this area developed the fast food management area, so it must create opportunities as well. <clears throat> Uh, so due to these, uh, considering this uh, situation, so in 2015, so uh, the area of uh, the Gulf of Modama project was started there, uh, focusing on the fishery de development of the region. And then it went uh, like this was, uh, uh, like kind of implemented by uh, from like the consortium member of uh, Hazardous Myanmar and IUCNs and the network uh, activities groups or NAG under the funding of uh, Swiss Development Corporation SDC. So uh, this this project, the whole project, spent over uh, a decade. And in, in 2020, uh, in 2018, or in the phase of phase two of the project, so uh, we, like they, we kind of uh, recognized that we focused a little bit less on the ecosystem. That's why we decided to have the ecosystem approach to ma uh, fishery management uh, with the, uh, by doing the co-management of these resources with the governments uh, in the upper level and then like the community level in the uh, like in the bottom level. Uh, however, uh, it, so it seems uh, going very well, uh, planning all these things and then implementing and I'm ready to implement those steps. But in 2021, uh, so the military uh, took over uh, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, democratically elected uh, government uh, through the factor coup. Uh, so that's why all these uh, buildings and all these, you know, offers are kind of uh, collapsed. And also we have to kind of reconsider. And so instead of co-management uh, studying in 2020, so we are uh, planning, uh, we are uh, working through um, instead of uh, co-management, so community-based EFM activity with the communities. Uh, so when we talk about like the uh, EFM, so it is kind of an integrated management approach uh, across coast and marine areas of the region. And also like its natural resources by promoting the conservation and sustainable use of the ecosystem. So it was uh, uh, direct, it was from uh, the uh, FAO. And then it is said that in order to implement uh, so EFM, so there are like three main uh, pillars that we have to uh, develop. Uh, kind of and uh, put them in equilibrium. So the first one is ecological well-being, uh, social well-being, and then good governance. So by uh, making uh, these three uh, equilibrium, so we can um, uh, we can achieve the sustainable and wise use of the ecosystems. So we follow uh, the FAO guidelines. Um, and then like the process of the EFM is as shown here. So the first one is about like, uh, we identifying the scopes of uh, the area that we would like to manage and, uh, and then uh, we identify the priority dice issues and goals uh, for the management of these areas and then de develop the plan. So right now we are still in the process of developing the EFM plan uh, due to uh, current political issues as well as uh, other pandemics and other stuff. And so after that, so we will be like, it will be continued to implement the plan and then evaluate. And then so it's kind of the iterative process of um, natural resource management uh, while uh, sustaining the livelihoods and the well-beings of the uh, fisheries. <clears throat> Uh, so this is kind of uh, the main uh, the main things that we are implementing in the Kafka Modama. So like uh, so our goal is about um, do to do and then define the EMU or the ecosystem management unit, and then we uh, promote the wise use of coal standard for resources uh, through the EFM approach. Uh, so why are we are considering three main pillars as our main uh, our three objectives? So the first one going to be ecological well being, and then uh, social well being and as well as uh, the good governance, while we are make sure that uh, we reduce the conflict sensitivity and also like uh, kind of increase the inclusivity and the gender equality, as well as uh, we finally promote the wise use of natural resource um, management. Uh, so with that in mind, so we kind of, uh, the project and the, the communities, we kind of co-develop eight uh, ecosystem management unit that apply ecosystem uh, approach to fishery management, EFM, uh, across the Gaffa Motama. Uh, so we develop eight regions and in each region, so the, in each EMUs or like in each unit, so they will be uh, developing their own plans and then implementing uh, their activities. Uh, so in order to implement so like the three main areas would be so uh the first one gonna be uh the first one includes uh protecting the critical habitats and critical species of form sense and to make sure that we can gain the ecosystem services and uh, conserve the biodiversity of the uh, EMU area. So this is the first one. And then, uh, so the, the, the second objective is about like the uh, security and diversification of the livelihoods and then developing the skills of the community so that uh, they can get better in tank income or better well-being. So in that section, so we can include it uh, like fishery development and agriculture development and so on. Uh, so the other is about like the, the last one is about the good governance so after uh so kind of uh, we are working with communities uh, to establish the good governance uh, or uh, the government systems uh to implement uh, these kind of uh, the plans that we did development in each emu uh, through the efm guidelines uh, so this process is a uh, kind of very long process and also uh during the like during the process, so we kind of uh, we face with uh, this military coup as well as due to COVID uh, nineteen situations. Uh, so like the consideration process is not as inclusive as we expected or as the project aims. Especially uh, we didn't uh, have a chance to involve the government stakeholders and also like the community community is not that uh, the presentation of uh, the participation of the um, communities in the process is not that representative as well as uh, because of firstly we aim to uh, have um, co-management 
Um, we aim to have uh, co-management with the government, but due to this changing uh, political situation, it is not possible to continue uh, with the government. That's why instead of doing the co-management, we have to change to community-based uh, action. So that's why um, even though like uh, even though we are kind of uh, starting we are ready to implement these kind of activities. So due to these kind of changes, uh, we are kind of going back uh, to the community level, community empowerment and so on. Uh, so, and also like these kind of uh, political situation and instability in the countries make difficult uh, to closely engage with the communities as well. Um, yeah, uh, so this is kind of the situation. And also based on that, so we are kind of going back uh, to the, um, scaled uh, to the kind of empowerment of the community to lead uh, this kind of EFM activity by themselves through community action. So we are kind of hoping uh, the behavior change um, the behavior change from uh, social ecological uh, concerns they, they, that they have and do like uh, pro social ecological behaviors. So that's why in this process, so what is needed is uh, we might, uh, we have to uh, imply in the capacities for the communities uh, so that uh, they are confident in them that they could start something as well as we have to provide the opportunities for them to participate, for them to talk or for them to uh, involve in those kind of decision-making process or even in implementation of these activities. So it will motivate them to participate more, to involve more, and it will create uh, to be uh, sustainably involved in those kind of processes. Uh, so this is kind of the strategy that we're moving forwards and then that uh, we are um, implementing in the with the communities so especially like we are raising awareness about uh, awareness about like the community importance of community and conservation processes we expanded our space uh, for inclusions such as involvement of uh, international communities as well as youths and other uh, stakeholders such as private such as university and so on uh, so this will uh, finally um, uh, kind of motivate them to participate more in the project uh, so that's uh, uh, so that they will be uh, so that they will be more involved in that process. So I think uh, so this is a very kind of long process and very frustrating process uh, that we navigate through. Uh, but we're very optimistic that we are stay on the right track and then uh, we are focusing on the communities and then uh, moving forward to achieve the sustainable use of our natural resource management in the um, in the Gaffer Modama for the six of the small scale fishers in that communities. And thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Win. Win Te. So next uh, presentation will be Ilya, right? Okay, please yeah. start your I presentation. Nice thank screen. you. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Iria Garcia Lorenzo, and I will present. I will put this because I cannot see in this moment. Right, it's perfect. And I will present community based fishery organizations and sustainable development lessons learned from a comparison between European and Asian countries. This is a paper done by myself and by professors Manuel Varela La Fuente and Diwan Asan. Uh, as I told you, I'm Iria Garcia Lorenzo, but you can just call me Iria. Uh, it's in Spanish name, a Galician name, and I'm postdoctoral research fellow of the University of Vigo in Spain, but right now I at the University of British Columbia in Canada, doing like two years of postdoctoral research stay. And in this sense, I want to acknowledge that the UBC Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Muskian people. And I want to add it to this that since I'm here, I'm here like from Simon for three, almost four months, I have learned a lot about the indigenous communities. So I also want to acknowledge that new perspective that I'm gaining here from, from their knowledge. My paper, our paper has a traditional structure with introduction, theoretical framework, methodological aspect, then the results of the main case studies that we studied for uh, five different countries then the discussion and the conclusions. 
Good introduction. First, like we all know here, like the small scale fisheries have a very important role in the sustainable development in different things like the food uh, security, like the environmental protection, the, the economic activity and the economic impact in the regional and the global scale. And there is a huge diversity and complexity of small scale fisheries that makes it very difficult to find unique solutions uh, to, all the, to all the problems. It has to be like specific solutions for, for different problems and challenges. And in this sense, uh, the focus of our, of our study are the community-based fisher organizations. And in this moment, I will just take advantage about one presentation that was done before in the, um, in the general session uh, from Richard Gregory, because it's somehow very different, very similar to the things that I'm going to present right now. And I don't know if you realized there, but he just said like sometimes community-based organizations, sometimes small-scale fisheries organizations, sometimes associations, and it's that the focus of our study are the fisher organizations that are formed and managed by local communities. And around the world, these organizations can have very different structures. For example, we have the cooperatives, like this in Japan, very well known, and in Korea also, uh, but they can be also like producer associations, producer organizations, associations, and traditional organizations with other specific names that we are going to see in the case of Spain. And all of this has really a specific characteristics and different characteristics that is the object, objective of our study. That sometimes we just talk about the communities, but we don't know, we don't focus on how they are organized, on what, which are exactly these communities and the collective action inside this, these communities. We just talk sometimes. Is he gone? So where is Iria? <laughs> what is wrong? I'm not sure what what happened. Idea? It disappeared. <laughs> Can you hear me now? I was yes, just yes. I, I, something happened with the internet. I don't know why you always have like technology. Okay. I don't know where. No where, problem. Just uh, where were continue I, your your presentation. Yeah, I will continue. I don't know if you yes. miss a lot or not. So sorry. I hope it will not happen. I, I don't know. It was like internet that it just disappeared <laughs> totally and completely. Okay, so. I was in the introduction. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry again. So I was saying that our point is that the community-based fisher organizations. I don't. I will just maybe repeat a little bit because I don't know where did you lost <laughs> where I lost the, the connection. So they can be like producer organizations, cooperatives, uh, associations, traditional organizations. They may have different forms. So we decided to go for the name of the community-based fisher organizations. We also think about the small-scale fisher organization name, but we think like the name of the community includes so how also like the small-scale 
uh, perspective and also give a more approach of what we wanted to do. So it is really important to know like the internal characteristics of how are these community organized because this can uh, hinder or facilitate the, the sustainable development of the small scale fisheries. And for this, we apply like we apply two different um, frameworks. First, the new institutional economics, the interactive governance that we all know, like different uh, modes of governance that these community based fish organizations may be most in the co governance or in the self governance, and mainly in hybrid modes that are the most that exist. And we use the terminology of the socio ecological system because I must say that I'm quite devoted to ocean, so I like uh, how the socio economical system is presented. So it's the main framework that we, we use. Because say it all, I don't know if this you lose it, but uh, I really like the presentation that was done before by Richard Gregory, and um, it's very related with this. So uh, to include all like the path dependence and the resource system, the governance systems, we need um, to know also uh, how the community arise in which context they arise. So we apply the system for, for this idea, and then we apply also like the social and society economy. Um, for one side, there are many um, community-based fish organizations that are cooperatives, as I say, like the Japanese. And in the case of the Spanish one, it's also considered a social economy entity in the Spanish law. And uh, I realized first my PhD in this uh, Spanish organization, about these Spanish organizations. And uh, we try just to scale up and try to apply this methodology, maybe not such in deep because like uh, we can apply all the methodologies of the social economy, but we try to apply to, to other organizations. So we arise, uh, it arises more or less from, from this perspective, but it's true that it uh, fits very well with the idea of what are the social economy, social and solidarity economy entities, as I will read, they are a, a broad set of organizations enterprise that are specifically near to producing goods, services, and knowledge while pursuing both economic and social aims and fostering solidarity. So we will apply like the seven cooperative principles that you can be here, but I will speak maybe a little bit later. And the methodology is that we apply these two methodologies to the six countries, to the five countries, sorry. And that they are somehow with institutional, historical, environmental diversity among them. Okay, uh, we did these points from each one of the countries, from Spain, Portugal, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Bangladesh. And we study how the bad dependence of the organizations, the resource systems where they act, the governance systems, the network structure, the main regulations that they have, if they have or didn't have, and the fulfillment of the cooperative principles. Right now, we'll show you like the main tables. They have a lot of information. I will not display everything because uh, it will take like um, 50 minutes for each one of the cases, but just to maybe have the idea. And if you have any questions, I will ask. Uh, you can ask later. So you see here, we have like the resource system. If there are marine waters, uh, like mainly in Spain, that we also have like the rias, the estuaries, or in Portugal, that are many marine, pol um, marine waters. Uh, in Cambodia that are like inland waters mainly, even they have also marine, but they are mainly inland waters. So which were the resources, the main activities, if there was also a small scale, if they were still fishing, the governance systems, like in Europe, you have like the European Union, the network structure, that is very important, the role of the NGOs, for example, in the Southeast Asia, that's in, in Europe is not that relevant. So it was also the, the structure and the main regulation that in this case, uh, for Spain, there are specific regulations for the cofradías, that is the name of the Spanish one. In Portugal, there are not a specific regulation. Uh, in Cambodia, there are also specific re regulations. And in Vietnam, also, there is one new regulation from the, the new uh, fishery, fishery law of the 2017. And in Bangladesh, there were not national laws uh, for the specific condition of the establishment. And Regarding the um, cooperative principles, one thing that I want to highlight first is the name of organizations that inspire and the cofradías. As I told you, in Portugal, we have producer organizations and fisheries associations, but we focus on the fisheries associations because we're the mainly for the, most, for the small scale. And in Cambodia, uh, they are named by the law community fisheries. In Vietnam, it's sometimes community, sometimes community organizations, depends on the translations that, that you have. And if you remember, um, Richard Gregory says something about community fisheries organizations. So it's like even the name, even how we name it, it's something that we can just go in deep on it. And then is the other 
the, the other is the community-based fisheries management projects that are quite different because maybe they integrate more these NGOs that could be for something similar for the uh, case that was presented also about like Indonesia. So in this part, we analyze one by one the, the cooperative principles. The first one is the most one of the most difficult because the social entities, social economy entities are private. And in this play, in, in this case, if they are private totally, there are none of them. So there must be public private, but this is the path depends a little bit that we, we somehow uh, analyze. And then the voluntary open membership, the requirements to remember, it's very important to know who are the members of these communities. It's really, really relevant. And not only if they are like men and women, and here I'm going to say also about that here from Canada, like if there are two spirits, I mean, also there are discrimination about uh, ethnics or about many or many other issues. So it's important to know who can be the members and just not going that. Uh, in Spain, maybe be more for a professional activity. So you have like some professional, requirements but in other place like in Cambodia it's like the Cambodian citizen of the territory uh, of, of that community so the relations that they will have with the resources are maybe different uh, in the same way it's important to know related with third principle the democratic member control uh, who are the management bodies because we can have a uh, good government um, more or less you know a good governance co-governance mode, but if then the community is somehow a, a small dictatorship or some sort of like power relations that some have much more power than others, uh, this will hinder all the opportunities that, that we may have with the common management uh, systems. The member economic participation is maybe one of the most difficult um, things just to um, explain here from the social economy, that uh, here we try to analyze if they were like only fishermen, uh, fishers, or they participate also in other activities like commercialization or suppliers, because it was also really important. One of the main ideas of this uh, social economy entity is that they have to participate in the real activity. But I do not, because I don't have much. And then the other principles, the principle of education, training information, concern for the community and cooperation with cooperatives uh, just for the nature. We could say that they almost fulfill if they say if you can see us on partially it's because maybe they are not really well organized between ones and the others that maybe in the case of the fishery associations in, in portugal so we analyze all of this for the different cases and in the discussion uh, we try to do a comparative and and present which were the advantages of the community-based fishery organizations to achieve the sustainable development and the challenges that they have so the main advantage is related with the poverty eradication, food security, and protection of uh, aquatic resources. It's that they ensure the fishing rights of the local communities. And when you go to the fishing rights, if you know the members, you can just go to the individual rights or to the collective rights, just to really realize the idea is just to really, really trace from the individual to the small collective action that could be the group to maybe the massive global collective action, but to really uh, know who are the rights of each individual or a small collective or household uh, that they have the, the rights that they have with the resources just to trace it up the definition of the group uh, and the rest against third parties the uh, functions to protect resources the traditional knowledge that exist i think uh, right now around the world it's maybe as big as the western knowledge the western science knowledge that, that we have so it's something that uh, it's really important um, and rated also with economic growth and production of inequality uh, these uh, fisheries uh, legitimate force to enforce the rules is generation uh, generate like rural employment uh, the benefits obtained from the economy that is related with this member economic participation that i told you uh, are related with the work that they provide i mean uh, this idea that they are the workers and the ones that realize the activity that ones that will have the benefits in this case economic benefits but we can also think about the uh, environmental or the social benefits so it's one of the ideas of the social economic entities um, and the lower transnational cost the stronger positions against third parties and uh, also um, uh, they have advantages from the strengthening of the institution the first one for example is one thing that it has been said that uh, they create a channel and the channel can be also right um, resistance or resilience in, in terms of when something uh, extreme happen. So that channel that's great is also very, very important. Um, the establishment of a specific regulation, we have highlighted that is something like really relevant and they have it like they can act better and if it's possible to base on persistent uh, traditional experiences better. 
and that there is, if there is a democratic system to elect the, the management bodies, it's ensure a more effective participation of the fisheries in the co-management and the provision of technical staff and support for the management bodies was also one of the advantages that maybe these collective and, uh, actions uh, have. And then the challenges, um, we have been seeing that when the resource is not limited, like inland or like in estuary waters, it was easier just to implement. They work, they, they work back the difference, for example, between Spain and Portugal, our main the resource. And we both had cofradias before, but in, in Spain, it remained, especially in Galicia, that's part of West Portugal. Okay. Uh, they remained, and in Portugal, they didn't remind. So it's a strong relation with the with the limitation of the resources. And in Cambodia, that they also like inland waters, they, they also were the first in the region that to have the, this, this loss. And one challenge is the specific uh, regulation for the Portuguese fisheries associations, also the paternalistic attitudes, because in the end, there are still like different attitudes, different like, short-term and long-term attitudes inside also the communities. So, and in the, in the co-governance systems. Management system. Next one. And the difficult of maintaining stable financial resources. At the end, we also have to, if we uh, ask the fishers to be to protect the environment, to be fisher, uh, to know about decision making, um, they in to have a strong institution, we have to provide some financial uh, support to them to do it. It's something like really important in these cases and in the in the recent cases. And maybe uh, in this case, we'll say like with the activities that they participate, if they have like commercialization with these organizations, they can also have ways to achieve these benefits if they are well organized. And okay, I will go to the next slide. And to the Asian uh, countries, we said like the power relations that exclude fisheries from the fisheries management. Sometimes also the networks are too, to, um, there are too many people, too many actors involved, so it can also like hinder the participation uh, of, of the fishermen, fishers, and the weak coordination among stakeholders, lack of institutional collaboration, lack of formal organization among the countries, uh, community based fishers among the one on, and the others, the participation of multiple actors, I have just said, the lack of training and technical knowledge, and the lack of economic resources, and in the other case. So it's important to establish a clear definition who, who are the members to ensure like the democratic relation or at least a participation process for the management for the management bodies to improve the control and surveillance of the fisher resources and to give resources uh, financial resources to do it. The participation of the commercialization uh, activities has been highlighted as something very important that really helps these communities, uh, this community organization just to uh, can carry out to allow us to carry out their, their activities. And um, yeah, just at the conclusion, I think I have been tired too long. <laughs> Sorry. Like the contribution of the community based fishing organizations of sustainable development is determined not only by the position with the vision system, but also for the internal structures and the capacities that they have to carry out in the co-management system. Like the title of the of the of the paper is Less, Lessons Learned about the uh, European and Asian countries. One idea was just maybe just to highlight the relevance that these organizations may have and to show that they are very different from one to the other. And maybe that uh, it could be like the weak part of the value chain. And we are not realizing that maybe the problems are also in, in these internal organizations. And as they are very different, they are different uh, in relations of the resource system, of the level of decentralization and the willingness and power of them, the self-organization capacity that they have, also the historical experiences that they have, the establishment of new definitions and formulations. Uh, a strong institution will give legitimacy to a third parties and stress decision making, while a better definition of the, its management bodies can allow local communities to be less influenced by stakeholders, something that is really relevant in the Asian countries and how like this, uh, it could be like money lenders or the, um, the power relation and extraordinary have been highlighted, it's very important there. In Europe, there also for sure, <laughs> and the collective development of the activities beyond destructive ones also present different possibilities. Possibilities, I have to say, and can reinforce the, the initiative. This part of the commercialization it was highlighted as very important in all the all the case studies, and the confluence of the attitudes of the long term and the short term. Somehow, it's going something that we have to to think about it from this from my perspective. It's like the individual, the small collective that they have, and then the global uh, collective that we are organizing 
this relation, how we organize this relation, it's going to be really important um, because how to align our objectives, I think is one of the measures we have to, to take care about. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry for the technological issues and if I have been like talking too much. Okay, thank you very much, Lydia. Yeah. So uh, we have about 15 minutes left. So we just go for a question Q&A. So all participants here, yes? Yeah, I have to present. Yeah, I ah, yeah, okay, uh, okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry, because I lost connection <laughs> yeah, yeah. for a while. Okay, please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Tong Tuo. Uh, yeah, I am the working with the Wildlife Conservation Society Myanmar Marine Program as a uh, working and focus on the marine conservation, especially fishery, thriving fishery and marine protected area along the coast of the Myanmar. Today, I, let me share the, my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, the, yeah. Sorry. I would like to share some the transformation about the small scale fishery in Myanmar, some lesson learned and uh, <clears throat> ensure fishery co management. Yeah, the overview of the today presentation about uh, introduction and content, uh, threat to marine coastal fisheries, some lesson learned uh, about the previous work, and also the case study for the Kifka generally insured fishery co management area, and then the opportunity and next step, question and answer. Yeah, for, for my presentation. <clears throat> uh, in Myanmar, Marines resources at a major contributor of the one of the high uh, to the food security providing direct livelihood to the estimate uh, estimated one uh, nearly two million uh, fish are with the uh, capital consumption one of the highest in the world oh my internet a little bit let me close the video Uh, <clears throat> Myanmar is currently facing the challenge time and the political unrest and the impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic that also threat in the marine and coastal fishery, overfishing, detracted fishing, coastal deployment, watershed degradation, marine pollution, um, uh, from the intraday industry, marine resource, uh, with other marine resource cap, uh, in adequate political law and enforcement, uh, climate change, like all the alternative livelihood, we collaboration and communication. Yep, some, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, th this present uh, exciting opportunity for transformation fishery management in Myanmar with management over ensure fishery for coastal management being developed as some uh, lesson learned Plan for the, uh, it the, the community, uh, the environment, the need for the ambulance environment. Yeah, we need to uh, build upon that trust, tra tra transparency, and honesty with the community. Needs uh, us uh, to know the better understanding of the fishery and fishery uh, resources capacity may be built at the all level. Uh, community and other stakeholder. Also, we uh, we met to create a better understanding of the need uh, for making the different management decision, uh, building upon the local culture, traditional, 
uh, we need uh, uh, need to cooperate all stakeholders uh, require considerable time ambition to develop implementation and sustain and uh, get the planning rights and uh, need to the affected enforcement supporting alternative uh, livelihood strengthening community gender as well as uh, com uh, also the we need to move uh, communication and awareness raising. Yeah, WCF. <clears throat> uh, by aligning with the Myanmar commitment and uh, the Convention of the Biological Diversity uh, and the Convention for International Trade in Endangered Species or Wild Fauna Flora Society, our marine program is focused on the supporting Myanmar to secure a sustainable future for its marine resources through for sanitizing and empower community thriving fishery secure wildlife sustainable uh, community uh, yeah did it uh, <coughs> uh, in the met uh, the over uh, the green line is the very important for the uh, for the coastal and also the marine, uh, that is the, uh, very important for nursery and uh, spawning, uh, uh, and also to support the local community to livelihood and the other uh, important biodiversity. Yeah, that is the red line, it, it, our the final site, co management area. Oh. Yeah, the overall goal to the pine local management in this area, uh, informed and guided by data and evidence, uh, the integrating strategy to reduce pine cat and the key biodiversity species, uh, sharing and replication in the about the uh, the management practice, mostly distribute muddy species fish feed are globally data efficient. Now seeing as a priority to collect data from the sports key fishery and mm -hmm. limited information management setting. We aim to help to deploy some insight into the final side fishery in uh, the western part of Myanmar coast, uh, generally to help enlarge the potential for management since 2016. Uh, a collaboration effort to involvement of many partners uh, uh, that uh, for many partners for nature resource governance agency and user. Uh, <coughs> in addition, uh, WCI also uh, the, the look at key partner of the Rakhine Fishery, Rakhine Coast Conservation Association, POP, the Rakhine Fishery Partnership, and a government agency. And uh, we, we are the technical, sub, <coughs> technical support from the University of ACESTA. <coughs> the, the, the main activity and output is the general sen sensitivity participatory planning process. Uh, and also the we call as baseline and data. Also the strategy to reach you intentionally by gas or the brain party break. <laughs> and also we are the sharing lesson learned from the <clears throat> fishery co-management planning and pride it uh, in, in local and uh, international. Uh, that is, uh, <clears throat> that initially we want to understand better community fishing and the KIU fishing ground, et cetera. This was primarily done through the participatory mapping activity and fisher survey interview. In addition, in since two, uh, October 2016, we also installed time as a monitoring system, uh, budget also called budget data system in passing boat, uh, which present the main fishery in the area that is given the greater understanding of where exactly both boat and when uh, this data came from the single vessel. Uh, that is 
this first year Fisher House socioeconomic interview sabi complete by local community and some of the WCS that during 2016-17 using questionnaire designed by University of Asia Star Fisher House. So we have been contact three nearly four four hundred Fisher at Time Valley also the landing site. Yeah, that is the primary at the baseline data. This also, uh, <coughs> we have collected the seasonally as learning site and cut data buying the study in 2016 uh, for providing a much better and a baseline to assess the future management decision. The current uh, situation with priority you know, collection and entry of the fish data, uh, this these data continues to uh, less color by community. Yeah, the pro uh, <coughs> this uh, the previous uh, effort and data collection have been held identifying the potential co-management area, the blood line. Uh, we are combining these data for all of the board uh, with the monitoring system. We are able to produce this map on the left that show the distribution and concentration of fishing in the area. We also want uh, with the community fisher to determine which type of PRIU where <clears throat> and, and they decide uh, together this evidence has found the foundation for determination of the management area so uh, yeah in this plan line yeah that is uh, within the 725 kilometer square generally uh, this management area specific zone uh, the, the rely <coughs> the the management area uh, uh, there is the notice so on seasonally closed, clear restricted, and that nest uh, that conservation area uh, have been delineated and uh, co management plan deployed to the kite implementation. The area are the co managed by between the government agency, uh, especially the Department of Fisheries, and uh, associate or the democratically elected representative for or tangentially fishing fillies with 50% female represented to ensure a seat at the table of the well, woman. And also they are uh, creating their own management plan and then follow about the year, the participating mapping, savvy uh, planning, zoning, yeah, capacity building in <coughs> 2020, eco management committee was established and register uh, with me and female representative from the town community. Uh, exactly, community have been what they elected the position. Uh, we are now supporting them to develop in the management uh, implementation, strengthening their uh, management capacity and uh, strengthening the connection or the connection and collaboration with the Department of Fisheries and other stakeholders. In 2000, uh, 18 August, Myanmar, uh, the Union uh, Department of Fishery uh, formally designated the, this gender legal management area, one of the first uh, arranged in the country. And also we, uh, we are supporting the, the uh, supporting about the, the community to the, the revolving fan and and yes and, and also the financial management and other things to the uh, this area yeah one of the <coughs> uh, one of the uh, the woman at the very important in this area uh, in the small scale fishery uh, we we support the perpetual and uh, in-person <clears throat> train, training or trainer for women incubator training was, uh, yeah, started in 2020. Yeah, Camoria Social Enterprise, she yeah, support her enterprise investment 
left uh, this training during the 2021 uh, the the wcs stat and the the Luga community uh, woman and yeah different fee sites are being conducted uh, against planning in local language before the ground training with the community commitment to gender equality within uh, fishery Comedy now now the uh, they are uh, continue the online and in person training in in the coastal area. Yeah, one of the another thing the uh, <coughs> uh, the this area we have been contribute. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, also the tenure but uh, marine patrolings uh, in the happening in since 2018 they will be uh, uh, patrol with the government and community uh, to survey uh, in 2018 we uh, we support the technical smart marine smart patrolling and uh, deploy to the look uh, deploy to the uh, marine patrolling system in this area uh, one of the another important thing the communication awareness region how we uh, will be contributed in this area a lot that uh, the, the communication and the awareness region is the very important for the co-management system the other <coughs> the sensible evidence uh, is the uh during as a the recess or the co-management process, uh, five only released CETA tenants have been identified fine and the, the community uh, safe and uh, hatching and to release to the uh, to the sea. Yeah, that is uh, the community have the patrolling and uh, washing in, in the beach by left by community yeah that is the same evidence uh, at in 2021 that that is the every uh, the hatching system and there's some data Hi, dr Tao. yep yes could you please make a conclusion because uh the yeah. time yeah, yeah. is already over yeah the, we already thank you yeah yeah yeah, two area in the the western Mimakus and also also the uh, southern part, uh, the, the the area, uh, co management area. Yeah, working in now. Yeah, that is the next step. We develop this memory patrolling and tra training to to the community and uh, strengthening community lab biodiversity monitoring, patrolling, see data conservation, education awareness. Yeah, like this activity we will be continued in this co-management area. Thank you. Thank you for timing. Yeah, that's my sharing. Thank you very much yeah, for, for the, the nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice yeah. Uh, presentation. And uh, now time is already over. I'm not sure that uh, all participants see anyone who have a question or not. Maybe I can give another five minutes for for question and answer. Okay, maybe no questions. So I I would like to close the the session and would like to thank you everybody for the nice presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.